Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Would you please welcome Marissa Meyer. Google Artist themes. We launched them in early May. And it's interesting, we launched them with 70 artists from six continents. We had designers, fashion designers, uh, choreographers, cartoonists, a little something for everyone. But the reason why it's interesting for developers is because this was built on the iGoogle themes API. It wouldn't have been possible had it not been for that open platform and for external developers. And it's one thing that we're really excited about. In my talk today, I wanted to share some of the insights and observations we've had in building some of our services at Google, how we work with both our internal developers and our external developers to build the pos best possible user experience, because that's what I do in my role, think about the user experience and think about search. So one of the first observations that we've made is the ordinary and the everyday. The ordinary and the everyday, it might seem boring. It might seem like, why well, would we focus on the ordinary and the everyday? But what's interesting is when you focus on the ordinary and things people use every day, you solve big problems, things that touch people's lives every single day that they use every day. And iGoogle is a great example of that. And through the open platform on iGoogle of gadgets, we've seen all kinds of new gadgets appear. And this is really about being able to take the Google homepage and put your content as developers on it so it can reach a much broader audience in terms of users. We have things like a to-do list that was built by Lab Pixies. Some of the developers of these gadgets might be here, or eBay Search, eBay Search Plus, Weather, DVD Reviews, the Crossword Puzzle from the New York Times, Discovery Channel, Currency Converter. But what's really interesting about these gadgets is that they really represent a new possibility for developers, for companies. They're a new form of distribution. Many people think of them as a new form of advertising. I might never make eBay my homepage. I may never make the New York Times crossword puzzle my homepage. But today, through gadgets, these have an opportunity to participate in my homepage experience. So, and, and, and the opportunity is immense. When you look at things like I Google Gadgets, this is a Pac-Man gadget made by Kim Schultz. So you can actually play Pac-Man on your homepage. But we have literally thousands of developers creating tens of thousands of gadgets that get a large amount of traction. This Pac-Man gadget has half a million users. Some of our best gadgets get literally tens of millions of page views each month. And it's by focusing on the ordinary and the everyday that you really get that opportunity. You get to work on something that people see and touch and very, is very meaningful to them every single day. And so that's why we think a lot about what are the most used apps on the web. We, we used to say when Google starting that search was really important to us because it was the number two most used app on the web, second only to email. And when you look at the other things people do on the web, it's in building features for these, it's in building, in building extensions of these, and building out these realms that you really solve meaningful problems for our end users. And it's through to that ordinary and everyday focus but as you can see with things like the artist themes, that's when you actually achieve something that's extraordinary mm -hmm. and every day. Mm -hmm. And on the co topic of the homepage, that brings me to my next, uh, our next observation. You're all familiar with Occam's razor for logic, that the simplest answer is probably right. The same thing is true in design. The simplest answer, the simplest design may also be right. 
which brings me to the home page. So people ask about our home page all the time. What, what causes us to you know, yield this very clean, minimalistic, iconic home page with nothing on it? And I can't take credit for that. Um, I actually, while well, I've been the keeper of the home page for the past eight years, Sergey actually did our original one. This is Sergey in our company uh, picnic dunk tank. <laughs> and I asked Sergey, I said, Sergey, people ask me all the time, what inspired the plain blank Google homepage? And he looked at me like I was kind of crazy and said, we didn't have a webmaster, and I don't do HTML. <laughs> <laughs> So that's why our homepage is blank. Sometimes you just stumble into this stuff just because you're lucky or through for lack of aptitude or, or, or patience. And that's why the Google homepage looks the way it does today. It's sort of more about expedient solutions and much less about b b grand and broad design. Um, but when you look at the homepage, there's a bunch of, of interesting observations that by putting it out there so cleanly and plainly that search is what we focus on, it says a lot to our users. That, that very simple design is in many ways the right answer. And I also should add that it's been largely misunderstood over time. This is our homepage as it existed in uh, late 1998 and 1999. That's our old logo. And when we went and did our very first set of user studies at Stanford, we, um, we had about 16 students. None of them had used Google before. And when they brought up, what we did is we gave them, the first task was, find out which country won the most gold medals in the 1994 Olympics. We'd like you to go to this website, www.google. We had to spell it because none of them had, had heard of it. And they pulled it up. The page would load. And we had two users sitting at each computer because you know, it was our first user study. We were nervous. We didn't really know, should we talk to the users? Should they talk to each other? It seemed better if they would talk to each other rather than to us. And when we looked at this, what would happen is they would go and turn, they would say, please, Try and find out the country that won the most gold medals. Turn to your computer and, and, and visit this website. And they would turn, they would type it in, and the website would come up. And they would wait for 15 seconds. And you think, they're thinking of terms, right? Th sometimes it's hard to think about what to search for and hard to formulate a query. After about 15 seconds, you're like, and after about 30 seconds, you're like, well, why, why aren't they talking to each other? <laughs> why, why wouldn't they be brainstorming with each other about what to search for? No, no, no discussion. 45 seconds, you're like, oh no. You're not supposed to intervene in a user study. You're not supposed to interrupt them. But I think I'm actually going to have to like, lean in and interrupt. And this happened with all 16 users all day. And you'd have to lean in and say, I'm sorry, but what, what are you waiting for? And their answer was, I'm waiting for the rest of it. <laughs> the very first homepage was that misunderstood. Everything in 1999 you know, rotated, flashed, revolved, it asked you to punch the monkey. So this clean, blank homepage, <laughs> right? Like, it didn't actually... Bring, resonate with people, and we realized that we were literally wasting man years, lifetimes of people loading up Google for the first time and just not getting it, <laughs> right, just waiting. So it's interesting, when you go to the homepage today, you'll see there's a copyright on the bottom of the homepage. It's actually not there for legal reasons. Our lawyers have said, you know, copyright's implicit, you don't need to enforce it. It's there as punctuation. It's there to basically say, that's it, nothing else is coming, please start searching now. <laughs> Um, the first user study was also interesting because it, um, we had all kinds of interesting responses to our website. One was, is this a real company? People were very dubious. Uh, there was one woman who began to persist and ask me, how many people work there? And I was worried about biasing her because the answer was 80 and I didn't want her to give us more legitimacy than we really deserved based on the product. So I said, I'm sorry, but I, I can't answer that right now, but I'll, I'm happy to answer that at the end. And I really hoped that she would forget, <laughs> right, and not ask it at the end. But she did, and when I said, there's about 80 people who work there, her next question to me was, are you from the psychology department? <laughs> because she found the state of our website so implausible that, that she was sure that we were actually do doing a, a psychology experiment in disguise. And we weren't a real company. <laughs> But as I said, like, I think that it is important to think about how sometimes the simplest design actually is the right answer. When you think about what happens at Google search, it's really complicated. Let's say you did a search for beautiful code, maybe because you want to write some, maybe because you're interested in the Tim O'Reilly book. What would happen is if you issued that search from here today, it would go and it would bounce through some of our data centers. At this time of day, our data centers are all running fairly hot. So it would probably bounce through a few before it found a data center that could actually accept the query. It would then enter the data center. It would first be greeted by a series of machines called load balancers. These are the machines that watch all the other machines to see who's busy and who's not. 
and actually they would go ahead and, and earmark your query for a mixer. The mixer is the set of the infrastructure we have that mixes together our, all of our universal results, our ad results. It then gets earmarked for a web server. We'll query a bunch of web servers and mark one that actually is going to respond to your query. And then it hits about 300 to 400 backends that are all the different forms of search, all the different forms of ads, gathers together the best results. Then it's time for your query to go back to the mixer, which mixes those all together, getting things in the right relevance order, getting the right blend of universal results in, the right blend of advertising in. And then goes to the web server, where it will write out the actual HTML for the page. The load balancer marks it as done. And the query then travels back to you. It's a lot of complications. Actually, in that time, your query will have hit somewhere between 700 and 1,000 machines and will probably have bounced at the speed of light between several different data centers, coming back to you with about 5 million results in about 0.16 seconds. Very, very complicated technology, but behind a very simple interface. We think that that's the best way to do things. Our users don't need to understand how complicated the technology and the development work that happens behind this is. What they do need to understand is that they can just go to a box, type what they want, and get answers. And that's why Occam's razor about the simplest design yielding the, being the right answer is so important and works so well for us. Numbers, numbers, numbers. So, in addition to user studies, the other thing that we do at Google is we try and be very data-driven and quantify everything. We live in a world of numbers, about RPM, about searches per user, about total numbers of page views, all kinds of numbers at, at very, very precise, at very, very precise intervals. And we think it's important that you, one, know where you are and know where you want to be in terms of your metrics, that you know them well enough to be able to guess, if I make this change or that change, what do I think will happen to some of these important metrics? And that you also, as you're trying to innovate, know the state of the art. How much does bandwidth cost? How much does, does disk space cost? How close are we to actually maxing out what's possible? Because it's when you're riding that bleeding edge of those costs and of those possibilities that you really innovate. So one thing that we do is split A-B testing, where the idea is that we run on our site, on a segment of traffic selected for, for users based on their cookie, a small percentage of our users to see new and different user experiences. Because what's interesting is at, at Google Science, and, and I think on the web in general, which is one thing that's really exciting, is that si design has actually become much more of a science than an art. Because you can iterate so quickly, because you can measure things so precisely, you can actually find different, small differences and mathematically learn which one is right. So these are three different versions of a, of a layout that we ran on our result page. Can you see, I, I apologize for people in the back because you probably can't, but can you see what's different about the three? White space is the right answer. So it's very subtle, but if you look, that blue bar where it says web products images is slightly further below the Google logo on each, in, in each different interval. We had a question. We had a question of, which amount of white space is the best user experience for our users? How much white space do they want? more or less? How does it affect our overall revenue? But even much more importantly, how does it affect our user happiness metrics? Do they, do, do they search more or less? Do they click more or less? We have a number of metrics we look at to try and understand on a broad level what makes users happy. So we went ahead and ran these three, and you'd think that we actually wouldn't be able to tell the difference, because it's actually really hard to tell. There's just a few pixels of difference in each one. But we came up with statistically significant evidence that A, the one with the least amount of white space is actually the right one for the top of the page. But this is one thing that I find really exciting. This idea that you can actually test these interfaces, and this applies for all web applications, you can test interfaces and be able to tell in a mathematical way which one works better for your users, which one is a better user experience. We did the same thing, and we love it when things work out this way, design and science rather than art. These are two iterations of different colors for our ads. We wondered, you know, should we keep them blue, which was the standard at the time, or should we change them to yellow? And it turned out that, one, yellow actually did yield a higher RPM. But in addition, the other thing that happened was all of our user satisfaction metrics went up. We got more searches per day. We got more page views per day per user. All of the metrics we like to see go up. 
actually went up. And so it turned out that in this split A-B test, yellow turned out to be better. But it's that kind of data-driven focus and the ability to iterate and measure things on the web that I think is really exciting in terms of being able to optimize user experience in a way that's incredibly scientific. Understanding users better than they understand themselves. So one thing you need to do is, this of course, this, this, this slogan for me calls up two, uh, different, uh, two of my favorite quotes, one from Sam Walton, if you don't listen to your customers, someone else will. <laughs> Right, and then the other one, which of course is Henry Ford. If I had asked people what they would, what had wanted, they would have asked for, for faster horses. I think the beauty of split A-B testing is that in cases where users might not be able to articulate the trade-offs that they're making, you can actually still test for it. You can still see it. You can still find out their preference. This is an example of another test that we did. In this test, what we looked at was the default number of results. Should we have 10 results? Should we have 20, 25, 30? Larry and Sergey came to me one day and I said, you know, we, we did 10 because that's what AltaVista did. We don't actually know what the right number of results are. So we went and we asked our users in user studies, would you like 20 results? Yes. Would you like 25 results? Yes, even more so. 30 results, best of all. So we went ahead and we put them in split A-B tests on the site, giving people 10, 20, 25, and 30 results. And we waited to see what happened. We waited four to six weeks. And this interesting thing happened where inside of six weeks, we were cruising along, and the number of Google searches seen from the users that were in the exper experiment dropped by 20%. So it turned out, and that was the most dramatic one. So when we gave users 30 results per page, they actually searched one-fifth less. And then we thought, well, wait, is that because they're getting more results per page and they don't need to click the next button as often? No, it turns out we get 20% fewer first page searches from those users? Is it because of the paradox of choice? Are we just overwhelming them with information because there's just too much on the page? Possibly, but I went ahead and I ran all kinds of regression tests against the logs. What was happening? How did the experiment group differ than the, than the control group? Was there another variable that we didn't control for? And it turned out, sure enough, there is. It turns out that it takes us longer to produce 30 results than 10 results, about twice as long. Makes sense, right? It takes us longer to actually go and pull all those re results and get them all formatted, sent back, the latency. But it's the latency that actually drove this decline. Users really care about speed. They really respond to speed. And so we know as the web speeds up, this is one reason why we're interested in Google Web Accelerator and also in, in, in just helping people build faster web applications, is that we know as the web gets faster, as Google gets faster, people search more. And when it gets slower, people search less. Speed really matters. We found the same thing on Maps. Maps, one of our original Ajax applications, is a behemoth, you know, by, by standards of regular HTML. An Ajax application, at some point, it had bloated up to 110K, 120K per page. It was really big. We were really happy. I mean, of course, it was right after Maps had launched, so the traffic was growing really quickly. But we looked at it and we said, you know, can we actually put Maps on a diet? Can we take those Ajax pages and can we make them smaller? And it turned out we could. We could actually pull somewhere between 30 and 50K out of them. And when we reduced the size of the page by about 30%, we saw that, the, you can see the launch denoted, um, you could, the, that we actually started getting about 30% more Maps requests. So basically, it's it was almost proportional. If you make a product faster, you get that back in terms of increased usage almost right away. And then, of course, on the user level, there's also the element of instant feedback. That's one thing that the web is, is really great about, is giving people instant feedback, instant gratification. And we learned this the hard way with Google Video. So on Google Video, when you would upload a video, we would upload it, and we would give you this nice little progress bar. I don't know if people ever used Google Video and uploaded things, if people here have. But the, we go back and forth and we say, please wait 24 to 48 hours to see your video. YouTube, on the other hand, came along and basically said, watch it now. Upload it, and it's there within minutes. And it's that kind of instant feed loop of being able to upload your video and being able to immediately see it rather than waiting 24 or 48 hours. It's true, latency and, this, and, this, and the commitment to speed is true both on the microsecond level in terms of serving speeds on sites, but it's also true in terms of just the overall user experience and interaction that's offered to users. They, they will respond 
an order of magnitude more to something where it shows up on the site right away. That said, the urgent can drown out the important. I think that's another thing to keep in mind when, you, when we're developing uh, web applications. One thing we've learned is how do you take searchers and make them better? That's one of the fundamental questions of Google. When, one thing we can do is we can make technology better, but could we do something that would teach users to become better searchers? Could we make the search interaction more didactic, help them build, build better refinements? But the interesting observation that came out of this when we started to think, should we have a version of the interface that's novice? Would that just get in the way of the experts? Is that the learning curve on search is really fast. People go from typing questions like, where can I get spaghetti and meatballs in Silicon Valley, which yields really terrible results, to Italian food, San Jose, really quickly. By a month later, because the feedback loop on search is so fast, you do a search, you get results, you can see how good they are, the same way YouTube did with videos. You upload your video and you immediately see it. Because the feedback loop is, in fact, so fast, it means that users get to the expert level really quickly, going from which stocks are doing the best this week to best stocks this week, and getting better and better answers. And what that ultimately means is we, we try and look ahead at that learning curve and aim for, we try and look ahead at that learning curve and aim for the, the expert user. Basically, try and understand where the user is likely to end up. Don't put things on the page that are too didactic, that you know, coach them too much, because that will just get in the way of the users that use the site 20 times a day or 50 times a day. Right? It's important to understand how fast the learning curve is on your application and ultimately build towards where you think people will end up in the longer term. And the same thing is true when you look at, for example, things like cell phones. Right? There's things like the StarTech Motorola to the Razor and then finally to the iPhone. But when you're developing applications, if you're thinking, it's very hard because everything on the web moves so fast. It's easy to get caught up in that urgency of what's happening in the next six months, what's happening in the next two years. Instead, to think out 10 years, what's likely to be true. It's interesting to think about cell phones, developing applications for them, realizing that there were probably a couple of fundamental truisms. Cell phones were going to be able to do more. They were going to have more applications. They were going to have richer processors. The touch screen was something that you could hypothesize about. And actually, building services, starting companies around that idea is something that is really powerful and compelling. We do the same thing on search. When we look, you know, if we know six months out, Whatever's happening in search, we're, we probably have in the pipeline right now. Two years out, again, people think that don't change as much in the short term as they do in the long term. So while we might not have all those projects in development today, we know roughly what two years out will likely look like. But it gets much more interesting when you start thinking 10 years out. We know that, for example, search 10 years out will probably be a lot more personalized. We also know that our, we will have a lot more content to index and that there will be a lot more relevance change. And so when we, when we think about how to build search, it's important to think about that 10-year-out case because it actually helps you build towards the ultimate right solution and basically get there faster. Universal search was an example of the urgent drowning out the important for us. So for years, every time we stumbled on a new piece of content, images, news, video, we would just immediately create a new search engine. In fact, in the end, you actually needed a search engine for all the different search engines. Should you use blog search? Should you use news search? Should you use image search? Should you use video search? And what universal search does is it tries to say, you know, it's great that we did these urgent and expedient search indices, but what we really need to do now is search all of them all together and put them on the result page. So when you search for something like how to tie a bow tie, you don't just get 10 dry links through URLs. You actually get pictures and videos. There's actually a video of a Harvard professor teaching people how to tie a bow tie and now in our answer on universal search. But while well, the urgent and expedient solutions are good, it's also important to be thinking longer term. What's the likely end solution? Is it one unified search engine? Where, where will cell phones end up? There's other things that we've done, like our unified login system. It was really easy for us to launch a lot of different applications where everyone just set up their own username and password server. But trying to unify those so you could have one seamless experience where I'm signed in one place, I could be signed in everywhere, is something that you need to actually focus on the longer term. Where do we want to end up in five years or in 10 years? Do we want people to have to type in a different username and password for every product? 
or will we actually see some interesting interplay and cross functions across those products such that we want a unified login system? Then there's the element of building real and flexible technologies. One reason that we like search is because it's really hard. And when you look at building out these, these uh, technologies, it's, it, they're, they're really interesting. Google 411 is exciting. How many people here have used Google 411? So it's, an, it's a free 411 service that we run where you can call in, you give it your, your search, and it sends you the results. Um, and sometimes we actually can't find the right answer. It's a minority of the time, at which point in time we need to tell you you can call a paid 411 service. But this is free 411. And I have to say, the one, one of the most interesting things from Google 411 is not whether or not free 411 is a good business. We don't know. We don't know if we can actually make money off of ad-supported 411. But what's interesting is that the, at the core of what's happening there, there's a real technology, which is voice recognition and speech to text. And if we can build out that engine and build that speech model, there's all kinds of different ways we can deploy it. We could deploy it for video search, pulling captions out. We could deploy it in terms of car activated search. It doesn't necessarily need to be tied to this one application. Certainly when you're developing, you need to tie something to a particular application. But when you're building something that's solving a hard problem, usually there's a real technology somewhere inside it that should your first application not work out and you need to iterate, there's a new way to package it up and, and deploy it for users. Cross-language information retrieval is also really interesting. We spent a lot of time lately at Google thinking about automated translation. Can we build automated translation? And we're excited about this largely because of the international work that happens at Google. So when you look at something like, it turns out about 1% of the web is in Arabic compared to English, which is almost 50% of the web. So what we generally don't, if you're an English speaker, you don't actually have very much of a hard time finding content. In Arabic, it's really hard. But the insight is, if we can build a great automated translation engine, what you can do is you can type in things in Arabic, we can translate your query into English, run the search in English, and then using that same automated translation, we can take those English snippets, those English titles, those URLs, and fold them back into an Arabic result set. And then you might say, well, what good is that? Now I know that they exist, but can I actually read the page? But then you deploy that automated translation again when the user clicks through, and you can actually create pages, pages on restaurants in New York written in Arabic. It turns out there's no typing tests on the web in Arabic, you know, if you actually wanted to see how fast you're typing, how many words per minute. But you can actually create one using this technology. And it's these types of technologies where there's the way we're deploying it today, which is very rudimentary, where you need to type in your, your native language, say which language it is, and what language you'd like to search. But you can imagine broadening this out, because it can be deployed in any number of translation situations. And in terms of search, it could mean that when you type your query, we translate it into all known languages, search all known languages, and then translate them back to your native language. So basically, if the answer exists anywhere, in any language, we can find it. And it's those types of things that we get really excited about. A healthy disrespect for the impossible. This is one of Larry Page's favorite sayings. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that a lot of the things that are worth doing on the web, a lot of things that we get excited about at Google, and I'm sure all of you get excited about as developers, is, are actually impossible. Search is an impossible problem. We'll never have the perfect solution. We'll work every day to make it better and better, but it will always be really hard. If you look at, for example, searches like Dr. Shivago, it's really obvious and easy to understand that this user is looking for a movie where DR means doctor. But things get more complicated when you say Rodeo Drive Burton Green. Here it means drive. And you might say, well, OK, now do we just need to differentiate where DR means doctor and DR means drive? But no, it can also mean things like best beaches in DR, meaning the Dominican Republic. So actually trying to take on these impossible problems of how do you disambiguate all of those different meanings of just two letters. And if you start thinking about the disambiguation that has to happen on search at a broad level, it's really exciting, but it's a really hard problem. If the same thing happens, you might say, well, you know, how hard is this? Well, what if you got something really specific, like New York Times Square? It's obvious that this is New York Times Square. But then, for example, if you just add two words, it changes the meaning entirely. The New York Times article on squaring the circle <laughs> it has a totally different meaning to New York Times Square. 
So when you're looking at how to differentiate this, you're actually working with a really hard, unconstrained, unconstrained problem. But we think that by just taking on the problem and getting to a 90% and 95% solution, you get a huge amount of the benefit. And of course, there's also things where, for example, the user, in terms of disambiguation, the user actually might not know what they're looking for. Wild wolf water resort. And it turns out that it's actually the Great Wolf Lodge water park. But they didn't know that. How can you actually correct and find user intent? So there's what they say, and there's what they actually search for, or what they're actually searching for, and being able to find that. But search is a really hard and unconstrained problem, and that's one thing that, that's excited about it. And when we also look at some of the new initiatives we have at Google, they follow the same mold. So when you look at things like Google Health, we launched this just last week. Users are signing up, and this is an attempt to basically put users' medical records in their hands under their control. Most people have never touched their doctor's chart. They don't know what is in their doctor's file. I know, like, I was trying to understand if I needed new vaccinations this summer for a trip I'm going on, and it took calls to four doctor's offices just to find out if I was due for a tetanus shot or not. But by actually putting those records in the user's hands, we think we can actually make a big difference. Having their prescriptions, their medications, their lab results all put together, their diagnoses all put together in one place is really exciting. That said, we recognize that it's actually an impossible problem. Right? We're ne we will never have all the health records online. There will always be some users, people who were just born. There will be always some system that didn't update. But we think that by trying to work on a really hard problem and a problem of that magnitude, that's something that would actually make a difference in people's lives, put them in more control, help them get better health care. And we think it's important to have that healthy disrespect for the impossible to take on challenges like this. And then there's also Google Book Search. So again, book search is an impossible problem. The idea of being able to scan all published content in the world, get it all online where it's searchable. There's so many books distributed to so many places, so many times where there's actually only one existing copy of a book that's even still left to work on. And then, of course, there's the ever-changing technologies of you know, how, does the, how high is the resolution of the camera? How does this work? How can we correct for curvatures and discolorations on pages? It's a really hard problem, but it's important not to get overwhelmed by how impossible the problem is, and instead to look at, can we actually build something that solves the majority of the problem and yields a great user benefit? Be scrappy, revel in constraints. <laughs> so people, I think, a lot of times think of Google as a large company, but the truth is we're a company that's composed of many small teams, most of which are resource constrained. We're constrained in terms of computers, in terms of time and energy and effort, and it's that appeal to being scrappy that I think is important both inside of Google and on, on the web at large. And I think it's really amazing to see when you actually work within those constraints one thing that can happen. So my, one of my favorite examples of this is Google from around the world. So Google right now operates in about 140 do, different country domains in about 110 languages. And you know when I think back, having helped with all that internationalization all along the way, it's amazing how far we've come. But when we first did our internationalization, things weren't this smooth. What happened was we actually contracted a full translation firm where we would go through, I actually worked on the web server at the time, we would go through and we would pull the strings out of the web server, package them up into a file, send them off to the translators. The translators would, of course, translate them, put them through Q&A, and about three to four weeks later, they would send us that package of strings back in all the different languages. But of course, in the meantime, we were a startup, and we were changing things all the time. We were doing all the split A-B testing, sometimes changing white space, but sometimes changing words, sometimes rolling out new features, which meant that we had all of the code in the web server. You know, if you have this version of the messages, use this. If you have a new version of the messages that's available, and this is for translation, do that. All these you know, macros all throughout the code of trying to do if this, then that. And then, of course, we had, you know, we called them FL to-dos, foreign language to-dos, to go through and clean them all up. And we'd actually have layers of to-dos in the code uh, to make things even more complicated. And we were going through all this madness, and we were able to internationalize into 14 languages with all that effort. Um, and then I looked at my friend Alan's site. It's called the Weather Underground. It's a small site run by about six people. And Alan was offering the Weather Underground in 50 languages. And I said, Alan, like, how are you doing this? Like, you know, we're killing ourselves, right? Like, I mean, it's like this two-month cycle. It's all these different, you know, macros and, and to-do cleanups. How is it that, that the Weather Underground is able to offer your site in 50 languages? And he said, well, 
He's like, we have people from all over, from all over the world using our website. He's like, and sometimes they mail me. And he's like, I get these mails that say things like, I am your number one fan in Bosnia. And he, he's like, and I mail them back and I say, do you speak Bosnian? Because if you do and you can tell me how to say the following 400 words in Bosnian, I will bring up your very own version of the Bosnian weather underground. Celsius, Fahrenheit, cloudy, sunny, right? And if he got those words, he could actually bring up the website. So we took that idea and we thought, what if we actually let our users from around the world participate and help us translate the site, help us bring Google into more languages? And it's interesting because what we did is we rolled out on the preferences page. So it turns out the professional solution doesn't work. The user-generated solution works great. On the interface language, when you go and pick your interface, when you end up on this page, we say, if you don't see your native language in the pull down above, help us create it. Join the Google in your language program. And if you follow that link, it brings you through a little application where you'll sign, you sign up, you say why you want to translate, and then you're brought into an interface where you see the original version, you see the translated version, you can work your way through the interface. Through that one link, that's the only link to the program, we've actually generated the world's largest translator network. About a quarter of a million people have helped translate Google, parts of Google over time, be it the toolbar, be it, be it search. But it's amazing to think about on the web, when you're developing applications, the power of being able to use your user base to actually get even more broad reach and more distribution. And of course, then uh, we offer just one little Easter egg um, here that, that I know developers, especially in Silicon Valley, like, which is that I was both, when I was an engineer and a product manager and a program manager on the volunteer uh, console, and at the end, it was my job to test it. Basically, we had to load in all the strings, and we had to go through it once. There were about 400 strings in total, and we had to make sure it didn't get stuck on, like, string 237, because the placeholders handling um, were, were, was reasonably complicated, because we would have to say, you know, results, blah through blah, of, and so on and so forth. But of course, the problem is, I don't actually speak any other languages well enough to be able to translate the whole site. So I thought, okay, how can I use this console? Because if I'm actually able to work my way through it, I need to have these translations. But back during my graduate student days, I found something called uh, Chef on the Linux prompt. How many people here know about Chef? So if you type Chef uh, at, the, at the Unix or Linux prompt, it puts you into a special mode of the computer if, if the package is installed, where all English words you type are echoed back at you as if they were spoken by the Swedish Chef Muppet. <laughs> <laughs> and so you type in banana and it comes back, banana. Um, and so it's really interesting. I, I, I always loved this program and I thought, well, you know, couldn't I just do that? Couldn't I just um, basically go grab, it turns out there's things on the web, apps on the web that are dialectizers. Did I lose my mic? Yes. Okay. Nope, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, so. At the Linux prompt, if you type in chef, you actually get the Swedish chef mode, where you can type in English, and it echoes back at you phonetics as if it was spoken by the Swedish chef. So you type in banana, and you actually get banuna echoed back at you. And they put in herty flirty schnip schnip and bork 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 and the way he laughs all throughout, all throughout this. And so I thought, you know, great, that's what I'll do. I'll translate the site into Swedish chef. Uh, and it turns out there's these things on the web called dialectizers, which are apps that probably some of you have developed, uh, where I could go and I could cut and paste these phrases into the dialectizer and then paste them back and just churn my way through it. And I got through it, and it turned out that it didn't get stuck on any of the 400 phrases, so we were good. Um, and then I realized that I now had a messages file. I now had a set of these 400 strings that were done by the Swedish chef. So I booted up a version of the web server that, you know, sucked this in, and it was hilarious, right? It's like, I'm feeling lucky, and hurty hurty flirty schnip schnip, bork, 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 all over the website. I thought it was hilarious. I sent it out to the Googlers, and I said, hey, guys, like, this is what it would look like if the Muppets ran the place. Um, and they basically um, said, you know, we should launch this on the site. So there's actually an Easter egg on Google. If you go to the preferences page, you can select the language bork, 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 which is Google Swedish chef style. And it's amazing because we actually have more than a million page views every day done in the Bork, Bork, Bork interface. <laughs> so, um, so it's a little Easter egg. It's fun. It turns out, like, Google's interface, again, the interface is simple. It's not that complicated. You don't really need to know what anything says. And if you need to, you can just sound it out Swedish chef style so it actually works. Um, and then the final thought that I wanted to offer is that imagination is a muscle. And when you're thinking about what problems to work on, what apps to develop, it's interesting just to actually get the creative and brainstorming juices flowing. One of the products um, that I get asked about from time to time is Google Ride Finder, which is on Google Labs. And people will say, you know, Google Ride Finder, like, 
what were you thinking? <laughs> right? Because I, the way this works is it actually is getting GPS signals off of taxis, off of super shuttles, and it shows you where those vehicles are. In theory, we thought if we could get enough of these, we might be able to predict traffic patterns, but it turns out there's much better ways of predicting traffic patterns than this. But it was still interesting. It was interesting for these engineers to look at, could we get those signals? Could we update them in real time? How close to accurate were they? Were they useful? It turns out no one actually catches a, a taxi this way. No one like looks at Google Ride Finder and is like, oh, there's a taxi coming down my street. I'll run downstairs and flag it. That doesn't work at all, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so people are like, is that what you were thinking? No. What was interesting about this was looking at those GPS signals coming off of those fleets of vehicles and thinking about how could those be mapped? How could those be visualized? How might those be useful? Again, this isn't the core application. There's, a, there's technology inside of this that might actually make this useful for things like tra predicting traffic patterns. But it's useful just the same because it exercises the imagination as a muscle. This is something that I like to do, which is the movie ticket out, out, outing application. So uh, one thing we've done since we were small is bring the, bring the Googlers to the movies. And it used to be that we would bring like 10, 11, 20 people. Last week we brought 11,000 <laughs> to Indiana Jones. And I still help organize these. And the reason I still help or, like organizing these is because I actually write the application that issues tickets as a way for me to keep my hand in programming. But again, like, it's good just to sort of keep up on what are the different state of the arts. Like, how, how can you evolve this? How can you make this more complicated? How can you solve for distributed ticket distribution? And what, you know, when you update to new versions of the database, what new things can you do? It's interesting to play with these types of things, not because it's useful, not because this is necessarily even the best use of, of time, but because it actually keeps you thinking about what's possible. And when we brainstorm at Google, we look at things that are very similar to that. We used to have brainstorming sessions where we would always open up with almost an absurd question. It's back to that healthy disrespect for the impossible. So we would do things like, should we build a suspension bridge between two buildings? And we would actually brainstorm out, how would we do it? What would we make it out of? How high should it be? All of those different elements. Not because we were actually going to build a suspension bridge, but because it's good just to get the imagination and the creativity going. So when you need to think about an impossible problem or you need to solve a problem where you have to be really scrappy and think inside the constraints, you really have that creative notion working. And of course, as you all know, things start from prototypes. So you know, when you're studying what's the state of the art, how well do FM transmitters on iPods work, being able just to experiment through them all and really get your imagination flowing. What if they worked better? What if their range was broader? How could these actually work? How could they benefit things? When you look at things like Google Street View, um, I have this blue Volkswagen bug on here because that's how Street View started for us. There were a group of Googlers in the office one Saturday afternoon, and we said, you know, do we think stitching technology has gotten fast enough and good enough that we actually could drive down the street, take pictures, and stitch the photos back together? So we went and we rented a really fancy camera for the day. We hooked it on to, we had the, the lens of the camera sitting in the passenger side. We also had a Canon Elf up on top on auto image. And we just drove the streets of Palo Alto to try and understand, could we get a clear and useful picture by the end of the day? And the answer is we could. And it turned out there were also students at Stanford University who had thought of the very same idea. So we partnered up with them to actually build this and make this a reality. But it's really about building prototypes, trying to understand what's possible. Is camera technology and stitching technology good enough? When we did Google book search, it all started with, you know, now we have very complicated scanning machines. We have a whole workflow of how the books come in and out. But when we started, it all started with a wooden board, a very bright light, and a camera. And it turned out that, you know, I turned the pages of the book. Larry worked the shutter. Sergey coached. And it turned out we couldn't actually get it right at all. When we were trying to digitize those pages, we kept catching my fingers. We kept blurring the pages. We needed a metronome. That was our big advance for the prototype of Google Book Search, this metronome that to told us this is how we should change the pages. This is the rhythm that the pages should turn at, which allowed us to do all kinds of computations. How many people would we need to have help scan books? How many books could we scan each year? How could we attack this problem that was basically intractable and, 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 and impossible and look at this? And of course, it all starts from these types of scrappy prototypes where you just try and understand what's possible. And this is really what 20% time. I know many of you have probably heard about 20% time, this concept at Google uh, is where we give people one day a week to do whatever they want. But that's really what it's about. It's about the imagination being a muscle. And when you let people work on what they're really excited about, what they're really 
creative about and build those prototypes, that's when you have really beautiful things happen. Google News came out 20% time. Orca came out 20% time. In fact, in one period of six months, I looked. people asked me to quantify the effects of 20% time. And I looked at all of our launches over a six-month period, and it turned out 50% of the features that we launched on Google's site actually started as 20% projects. So you know, people often say, is 20% time really about losing 20% of your productivity? No, it's really about helping people understand that they're empowered to build and create beautiful things. So in summary, the different things we talked about today is the way the ordinary and the everyday becomes the extraordinary and the everyday by focusing on big problems that touch people's lives each day. Occam's razor for design, that the simplest design is probably right. There's no need to expose all that complicated technology that we're all busy building in order to have our users have a good experience. Numbers, 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 knowing your numbers, knowing your metrics, and ha using them to ha actually help you understand your users, in some cases, better than they understand themselves, like in the case of the 10, 20, 30 results. Being sure not to let the urgent drown out the important. And building real and flexible technologies, this idea that there's the application you're working on today, but if you're really building an important technology, there'll be something in there that even if that application fails, you'll be able to deploy in new and interesting ways. The healthy respect for the impossible, reveling in the constraints brought on by those impossible problems, and imagination as a muscle. And that's the end of my, my talk, but I'd like to do some Q&A if possible. We're going to have some mics coming around, so if people have questions, we're happy to take them. Talking about the user experience uh, and the simple search page, have you seen Blackle? It's just Google and Black. Yes. And um, what are your thoughts on that with respect to user health, uh, energy consumption, and things like that? Sure. Um, well, it turns out that Blackle, it turns, we, we had to turn the screen black from time to time in support of Earth Hour. Uh, where people are encouraged to turn off their lights. We literally turn off the lights on our homepage. That said, it's really a symbolic gesture. Because of backlighting on screens, a black version of Google actually takes the same amount of energy, if not more, than a white version of Google. Um, and we also have heard some discussion around, you know, isn't black easier on the eyes? White can be very hard for the eye to absorb. We actually think that from a readability standpoint, and this has been borne out by cognitive psychology as well, that a white background with black text on the front is actually the easiest to read. Um, that said, there are things like the iGoogle themes, where if you want to change your page to black, you can. So on the energy consumption level, uh, black isn't actually that great of an idea, which tends out to be a wash. Um, and on the personal preference element, you can turn it black, but that said, we actually do think it's easier to read uh, black text on a white background. Yeah, either one. You mentioned that uh, there are better ways to predict traffic patterns than using the GPS signals. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, sure. So it turns out that, you know, for us, when we were doing the Ride Finder, we were actually licensing from each fleet individually, which is why we could only do the Bay Area. We were only licensing with the taxi fleets here, and we, could, and, we, and we slowly branched out to other cities, and we also were bringing in a super shuttle. And it turns out there are companies that actually aggregate all kinds of traffic from all kinds of vehicles that have GPS on them, because those fleets of taxis and super shuttles are only one part of the one small set of the vehicles that actually have GPS. Um, there are trucking companies, um, taxis, shuttles, and you know, everything else, but they also are much more broad because they're pulling all that data in collectively. And we actually anticipate that at some point, and some of the cars are starting to have this, that car manufacturers will begin to build GPS into the car system. So most cars will have this GPS signal coming from them, and that actually helps uh, to predict traffic. Fast Track does this. So it turns out there's just better sources that are more comprehensive. Let's go over here. Uh, you, you talk about uh, search end users. Uh, we're, we're developers and we're users too. We use programming languages, APIs, and we have, the, uh, as evidenced by this conference, the problem of incorporating lots and lots of them really fast. Do you have any, any sort of uh, way of approaching that in terms of learnability uh, so we can get to the point where we can actually draw our own architectural conclusions, for example, and uh, on a bunch of them fast? So I'm, I'm confused in terms of whether or not you mean something like Google Code Search that helps you search for these technologies or being able to optimize things like Google App Engine. Just, just the application, the APIs themselves as, as objects that have to be learned 
and, and use it effectively. It is something that we think a lot about. I think that one of the, the more astute observations I've heard in the past year was from Mark Zuckerberg. They basically said, you know, developers are developers, internal or external. And when you build tools that are good for your internal developers, they're good for external too, which is one reason why we try and bring many of our tools externally. That said, we all know as developers that it's hard to learn new APIs. It's hard to new, learn new languages and paradigms. We definitely are working on some technologies that we think make it this easier, cleaner, or more consistent. And we've released APIs that we think are commensurate with that. But that's the overall approach. So I don't think there is a, a, a silver bullet to that problem. But we're tr doing the best we can, and we release the, the, in, uh, the insights that we have. So. Um, you spoke about turning uh, user interface design into a science. I was wondering, how does Google use uh, open-ended user feedback Oh, well, so we do actually do get tons of emails, as you can imagine, each day. People having questions about particular queries, particular features, how they work. And we build off of all of those. When we look at user experience, we're really building off of explicit user feedback through emails, user studies, and split A-B testing. And it's actually important to use all three of those in balance. As we saw in the user study, sometimes you'll get an answer from a user study or from users explicitly, like on the number of results, that makes it seem like a good idea. And then when you go to test it in split A-B testing, you fi may find out that it's not such a great idea. What we do is we take feedback from explicitly from users through email and user studies, and we test it out ba through split A-B testing and then release the interfaces that are supported. Yep. Uh, curious what your thoughts on um, the complexity of uh, iGoogle's UI versus uh, the super simplistic Google. Do you feel like it undermines that simplicity? Well, I think that, you know, for a long time, I pushed back. People said, you know, why can't we just turn the homepage pink? Why can't we put more things on it, right? Like, well, they want to do this, and I thought, well, because the problem is you're going to turn the homepage pink, and three weeks later you'll hate Google, and you'll just be like, I don't like it as much anymore, and I just don't know why. And probably it's because of this decision you made. And I was worried about that. And then each summer we host a brainstorming session, some of that you know, exercise in the creative muscle element, where we look at what should Google look like two years out or five years out. And people get up and they put up a home page and a result page and say that this is what we think it ultimately will look like. And uh, the year before we launched iGoogle, what happened was one of my associates, Enrique, got up, and he knew he had this very controversial mock. So, and he said this thing. It was, it's funny because he said it so simply, but it was the first time that it really resonated for me where he said, most of our users like the clean, classic homepage, but some of our users want more, and we should give it to them. And for some reason, just putting it that simply of recognizing that the majority of our users will probably want to use that minimal homepage, but there's a non-negligible minority that can use iGoogle. And so I do think that there's things that you can't search for. You can't search for the email you're going to receive today. You don't know what it is. You can't search for today's news until you've read about it. There is some content that instead of being pulled in a search format, needs to be pushed at the user. And gadgets represent a really big opportunity that way. And it also is an opportunity to have the home page really reflect our users and their personalities. And I think that's one thing that's really exciting. Yeah. Hi there. Um, you talked about user happiness metrics. I was wondering what they were. Well, user happiness metrics are different for every application. I mean, it's really important to look at your own application and understand what's important. But we look at all kinds of different metrics, probably about 30 in all. There's a few that are, are more predominant than others. But you know, certainly we, we will do things that we expect to be revenue neutral, so we're looking at things like revenue. But the user happiness metrics are more things like how many people click on the first result, how many people click on any result on the result page. On a per user basis, are they searching more per week or less per week. You know, how does that ultimately work out? And so it really differs mm -hmm. per product. So for example, the measurements on search user happiness are different than, say, the, res the measurements on news or on book search. But it's really important to look at your applications when you're doing something like split A-B testing and figure out, this is the metric we're going to drive to. And it really makes it a much more pleasant environment to design in. Because you can say, OK, you know what? I can try this out. I can try this out without fear. I don't need to worry about, will this design get picked or will this design get used because so-and-so likes green better or so-and-so likes this layout better. Right? It really does elevate that design from being an art and you know, much more about, about personal preference and, and, and finally much more about mathematics and, and science. Right here. Yeah, you mentioned that this future search is personalized search. Is there any consideration to locking users in a box eventually where you can't search outside of your profile? Sure. Well, I think, first of all, there's a bunch of different things that are the future of search. One is we're going to see search in a lot of different modes. 
in phones, in cars. You're going to be able to search a lot more as part of your everyday life. You'll be able to search a lot more media. Pages and results will become much more encyclopedia-like. So you'll see things like videos, images, graphs, stitched together not just as a boring list of 10 URLs, but actually as a holistic answer to your query. And then there's the personalization piece, which we don't know exactly how, pe how we'll personalize. Maybe it'll just be a matter of knowing where users are, what they searched on, what they searched on last. It turns out that last element is one thing that we've seen improve search the most. What you just searched for is actually the best signal we can use in terms of improving the relevance for what you're going to search for next. Because we know what you just saw and we know what you likely discarded or were finding from. So it's interesting. We don't know which of those signals will matter most in the evolution of search. We know something will. Um, and so that's why we know that personalization will be really important in the future. But that said, we, do, we are committed to being able to port users' data and also make it very transparent to them. So when you look at things like Google Web History, where you can actually see what signals are they personalizing search based on, which searches have I done, what results have I clicked on, you can see all the signals that we're baking into our personalization function there on the page. And we're also working on ways to be able to pick that up and port it to other locations. So just like your medical records in Google Health, that same principle applies. You can take your data with you and you own it. Um, so when you're doing search for like simplistic result sets, like the one on the Google homepage, it's text. Um, have you found any differences in the amount of results you're going to give the user if you're doing a more like rich result set return? Like if it uh, has images to go with the text, if it has, because I'm doing an application right now that's sort of has thicker results. I was wondering if you had any ideas on that. Sure. And this, I, I just got the sign here. Two more questions. Um, so I think that um, when you look at rich result sets, one thing that I, th I feel really frustrated about in terms of the evolution of search is we do the same work on every query. Right? We get your query, we go to the mixers, the web servers, the, the ad servers, the index servers, and bring it back to you. But there are some queries where we should work harder or produce different types of results. Universal search is one step in that direction, but we have talked about doing something like differential processing. If there's a query that's very popular that you know is going to get run many times per day, maybe you should spend 10 times as long computing that up front, putting it in a cache and serving it. But I think that there's a t careful balance between being able to do more computational work, but also achieve that, that speed objective that, that I talked about, too. So you can do things like building up a more rich media set to return, but a lot of it has to do with caching and latency. And it's important to be riding the web of sort of where we are in terms of the time it will take for users to look at that, process that, download it over their connection, all of those factors. So would you say that when you're returning richer result sets that you should maybe serve less? Like, you know, if it's 10 text results, maybe you, uh, that's... I think another, in, yeah, I think that my answer to that would be, I think it depends on the result. Mm -hmm. It's not per query, it's not per user. It depends on what do you need to display on a result page in order to give a user an accurate picture and an ability to assess, is this the best result for them? With video, it turns out words don't do it. You actually need a thumbnail. With images, again, words don't do it. You need an image. So we've also talked about that even for text results, if a text result is really good, maybe we should do something like have a 10-line snippet, a much longer snippet on the result page, basically letting the user know we're really confident in this result. That's why we're giving you more information, but actually have that vary per result. So I can take one more question. Yeah. My, mine is... Uh kind of about uh, reporting problems to Google. Basically, as developers, we use a lot of Google services, and we also use a lot of the Google end user apps. And, uh, you know, problems are rare, but there actually are some bugs in some of your services, believe it or not. And there's there are in mine, too, so don't feel bad. There's, there's uh, more than a few. <laughs> so I, I've never really found a way, I feel, of re reliably reporting bugs, particularly on a more technical developer-to-developer -developer basis. I've tried different email addresses that I found by searching. I've tried the Google Groups forums on individual products. And in general, I sometimes get the feeling that my answers are kind of just, or my, my, my uh, reports are just kind of hitting a blank wall. Is, is there any specific uh, URL or, or uh, email address that would be best for reporting technical uh, areas that are not quite working right on products? 
I think this is something that we need to do better on. So I think that when you look at uh, what's happening on, on Google today, there is our overall support center where you can send in emails. And probably the email that it corresponds to the alias for the product is one of the best places to send it because we actually have specialists that are familiar with that product, will be more familiar with your bug. In many cases, the bugs will get reported several times, and so they'll, they'll tally them up so we can prioritize and triage bugs in, in prevalence order. Um, so sending something to a specific product helps, but I actually think that for technical people who want to file technical bug reports, we don't have a great answer right now, and I think that that's something that we need to work on in terms of our overall developer support. Thank you. And thank you very much. Thank you.